Molecular Orbital Theory. In this podcast, we'll first explain why molecular orbital theory is required and when we're going to be using it. We'll learn how to draw the MO diagrams for the first four homonuclear diatomics and learn to visualize the basic shapes of the S orbitals and sigma orbitals so that we can understand why some are bonding and some are antibonding. There are two theories of bonding that we're going to be talking about in this course. In this video, we're going to be discussing molecular orbital theory, but it's good to introduce the idea that there are two different ones here as well. Both of these are simply models. They're a way for us to describe and predict and explain bonding in, mo and explain bonding in molecules. Molecular orbital theory, or MO theory, is generally more accurate. However, it is also much, much more complicated. In this class, we're only going to be using it to cover diatomic molecules because after that, it gets just that much more complicated. You'll use it with larger molecules when you're in organic chemistry, and you'll see it a lot in labs where you'll be able to use a computer to solve problems, and so you can do it for larger molecules as well. And then, of course, you'll definitely see it a lot if you take physical chemistry. We're going to use valence bond theory for more complicated molecules, though, because although it isn't quite as accurate, it serves us rather well for many, many complicated topics and is much simpler to deal with. This is why we're going to start with MO theory, even though it's out of order from the books. Because MO theory we are using to solve very simple models, just diatomics, and valence bond theory we're using for more complicated structures, we're going to start with the lower level structures, with the molecular orbital theory, and work our way up. So what is MO theory? Let's just introduce this concept first. Molecular orbital theory is the quantum mechanical treatment of bonding. That means that we're going to be using wave functions to determine the shapes of the orbitals. Don't worry, just like when we did this for atomic orbitals, we give you the answers for this. So just like when we learned about wave functions in the quantum mechanics chapter for atomic orbitals, we're not going to be doing the high level math. So this treatment yields much better results when it comes to comparing to experimental results than something like valence bond theory. However, because these calculations require computers to find the energy levels, it also becomes extremely complex. So when we go to do hybridization, valence bond theory, etc., we're going to be looking at some big molecules. When we do MO theory, we're going to be looking at small molecules. And this isn't because MO theory can't do bigger molecules. It definitely can. But because we're using computers to figure out all the energy level diagrams, this gets more complex than what we should really be doing at a general chem level very, very quickly. So it can be used for big molecules. We definitely will do that in lab where you're using a computer. We're just not going to be doing it here. We need to do a little bit of review just to make sure that you remember what wave interference is. So let's remind ourselves of this. We can think about waves in water to imagine what wave interference looks like. We know that if two waves crash into each other, they'll start to cancel out if they're out of phase, if the peak of one wave interacts with the valley of another. That's called destructive interference. However, if they were to come into contact with each other just in the right phase, they can add to each other as well. And you'll sometimes see this when two boats get going next to each other with the wakes. This is called constructive interference. Let's look at this more mathematically. Remember from quantum mechanics that electrons act as both waves and particles, and this means that they have interference patterns. So let's take two waves, a wave that I have labeled 1 and 2. You'll remember this from earlier videos as well. And here I have the waves in exactly opposite direction, opposite phases. So right here, this starts at zero, while here, this starts at zero. But very quickly, this goes up while this goes down. And then as we go further, this is down while this is up. This means that they're going to cancel each other out having destructive interference. Now, if we were instead to combine two wave ones, 
where we were to combine this with another one of this, wave one with another one of wave one, what you would actually see is that they get larger because you're adding them together. And when you got down to the valley, if you were adding two of these up, you would add two valleys together, bringing this down lower. This is called constructive interference. So in ML theory, we'll be doing this with orbitals, or at least this is what will be going on behind the scenes. We're going to combine an orbital from each atom and make a new orbital by doing what we call a linear combination of orbitals. We'll effectively be using wave interference from the orbitals to determine the shapes of the new orbitals. Let's look at the simplest case first. Two hydrogen atoms bonded together. I have this drawn out with the two hydrogen atoms drawn separately at the moment, with one s orbital here and one s orbital here. When these combine, they're going to form different types of orbitals depending on how they combine. This is going to be a common theme throughout MO diagrams. We're going to be combining two orbitals to get two new orbitals. However, these new orbitals are not the same energy levels as the original S orbitals. Remember back to our conversation about interference. They're going to combine in both destructive and constructive manners. The constructive interference forms a low energy orbital. We call this the bonding orbital. And the destructive interference causes a high energy orbital that we're going to be calling the anti-bonding orbital. Look at these a minute, and let's see if we can decide why they're named bonding and anti-bonding orbital. First, let's think about the nuclei. Are the nuclei positively or negatively charged? We of course know that they're positively charged. So what's going to be holding these two nuclei together in a bond? Well, we have all of this negatively charged electron density between the nuclei, which is what holds it together. We know this already. Electrons form bonds. So now, let's look at where the electrons are situated in both of these orbitals. Let's start with the bonding orbital. Notice where most of the electron density is situated. It's all between the nuclei. If these white dots are our nuclei, most of the electron density is between the nuclei. This makes it a, more likely to form a bond because the electron density holds the nuclei together. Now let's look at the antibonding orbital. Here, most of our electron density is sitting outside the orbitals, not in between. This means that electrons that are put in antibonding orbitals are going to be pulling the nuclei apart, making them less likely to form a bond. And so we call them the antibonding orbital. Let's quickly review that last slide. We took two s orbitals and formed two new molecular orbitals called sigma and sigma star. The low energy sigma was called a bonding orbital, while the high energy sigma star was called an antibonding orbital. We started with two atomic orbitals, we get two molecular orbitals. Now we're going to talk about how to draw these diagrams and how to fill in electrons from low to high energy, just like in atomic orbital diagrams. We can now do two examples. Well, really we can do four, but we're going to start with our two simplest ones first. I've drawn out the basic structure for you on how we draw these MO diagrams. We obviously don't want to have to draw the pictures every single time that we do this that we had in the last slide, and so instead we use these lines or boxes to denote what the diagrams look like. Notice we have both the atomic energy level diagrams off to the side, here and here, and then in the center we have what we call our MO diagram. Instead of drawing the pictures, we just draw lines or boxes, but we need to make sure that we leave the labeling the same. So we have our sigma 1s that we created in our last slide, and our sigma 1s star. From here, we're going to just fill in our electrons from low to high. So we have one electron from each hydrogen atom. Notice I've already drawn in our atomic energy level diagrams because you know how to do that. And we fill from low to high. Each orbital still holds two electrons, and so we will put one 
2. Notice all previous rules that we know about filling electrons are followed. The orbital holds two electrons. One is spin up, one is spin down. And when we get there eventually, we're not there yet, but if we had two orbitals that were the same energy, you would fill across first. But that'll be for a different video. Now take a moment and do helium. I've already drawn out the atomic energy level diagrams for you. Now fill into the molecular orbital diagram. We have four electrons. So when we go to fill in, we do one, two, one spin up, one spin down. And now we're out of room. And so we need to go up to the higher energy level. Which leaves us with both orbitals filled. Now let's review what we just did. To make an MO diagram, you're going to draw your atomic energy level diagram first and put those along the sides. There's nothing new here, so we didn't really talk about it. We just did it. At this point, you know your total valence electrons from each atom, and you're going to fill into the appropriate molecular orbital diagram from low energy till high. Right now, as far as that goes, we just have the one. But we're going to be making this more complicated as we go into more videos. As you fill, remember that Pauli exclusion, Hund's, and off-ball principles still apply. Nothing new here either. Two electrons per orbital, one spin up, one spin down. When we get there, although we're not there yet, if you have degenerate energy levels or energy levels that are the same, you fill across first before you double them up. And we'll get to that in the next video. Now, let's do the next two species in the periodic table. I left up hydrogen and helium so that you can see the differences, but we've already done those. So now let's look at lithium and beryllium. We'll start with lithium. Along the sides, I've already drawn in our atomic energy level diagrams because you already know how to do this. So we always need to put those in first. Along the middle, we'll have our molecular orbital diagram. Now notice, because lithium is in the second row, we have both 1s and 2s orbitals. And so our 2s orbitals will combine in very similar manners to the hydrogens that we talked about and form a sigma 2s and a sigma star to us. Just like before, this is our bonding orbital, while the sigma 2s star is our antibonding orbital. Now we fill in our electrons. Don't overcomplicate this. I'm trying to figure out where the electrons come from and where they go. We've done the complexity, we've done the complex part already by making the MO structure. We have six electrons. And so we're going to start filling in from low to high. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we're all done. Now try to do the same thing for beryllium before continuing. Here we have eight electrons. When we go to fill this in, we'll start from low and work our way up. And so we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we have our eight electrons filled in. Now let's talk about one other thing called bond order. And we're going to go back and look at our MO diagrams to figure this out once we're done. This is very similar to the idea of a single or double bond that we've kind of lightly discussed while drawing molecules out. And we're going to be discussing a lot more in valence bond theory and while making Lewis structures and all of this. In MO diagrams, however, we get a lot of flexibility with how these are written. We've already lightly talked about how electrons form bonds. And in previous classes, you may have also discussed Lewis structures and double bonds and single bonds and other related material. And we know that it takes two electrons to make a bond, which means that every electron is worth half of a bond. So let's say that one more time, because we know that a bond takes two electrons Every electron is worth one half of a bond. 
If an electron is placed into a bonding orbital, it adds to the bond order. If an electron is placed in an antibonding orbital, it subtracts from the bond order. So every electron in a bonding orbital adds half a bond. Every electron in an antibonding orbital subtracts half a bond. We can put this into a formula, although don't think of it as an equation so much as just a way of figuring out what we just talked about quickly. Where we have our bonding electrons, subtract our antibonding electrons, and then multiply by one half to get our bond order. This roughly corresponds to single, double, or triple bonds, but we can have bond orders of decimal points allowed. In this class, you'll generally just see bond orders of inter integers or one half integers because we're keeping our MO diagrams pretty simple, but that can change based on more complicated MO diagrams. So let's find the bond order for each of the MO diagrams that we've already done. We'll find the difference between the bonding and antibonding electrons and then divide by two, since each electron only counts as half a bond. So for hydrogen, we have two electrons in a bonding orbital, no electrons in an antibonding orbital. So we do two minus zero, divide by two equals one. Try to beat me on these next ones. On helium, we have two in a bonding orbital, two in an antibonding orbital, and so we're left with two minus two is zero and a bond order of zero. This is why helium doesn't form a diatomic helium, because it doesn't have any bond order when we do that. Now let's look at lithium. Lithium has four electrons in bonding orbitals and two electrons in antibonding orbitals. And so we're back to a bond order of one, because we have four minus two. Now let's do our last one. Here we have four electrons in bonding orbitals, but we also have four electrons in antibonding orbitals, leaving us once again with a bond order of zero. In summary, we now know how to use MO theory and why we use MO theory. We know that we use MO theory over what we'll be discussing later on is valence bond theory, because even though it's more complex, it has a higher predictive value or it aligns with experiment more closely. And so that works really well if we need to be really, really precise. And so we're gonna talk about homonuclear diatomics. So far we've only made it up to beryllium, but we'll be moving on here in the next video to include p orbitals and pi orbitals. And we'll bring this all the way up through the second row homonuclear diatomics and then briefly talk about heteronuclear diatomics as well. We also can visualize the basic shapes of the orbitals for the sigma orbitals that come from our s orbitals. In future videos, we'll be extending this to the p orbitals as well, but for now, you need to make sure you know what the s orbitals look like, you know how they combine, and you know how we get this bonding-antibonding structure.